if you are interested in the things of God, then you are going to be kingdom-minded. And there's many different aspects of the kingdom. And these various aspects give us a complete view, a picture to understand, to comprehend, and what will be. And why do we need to know what is going to happen in the last days? The answer is so that we can be prepared. One very interesting, and oftentimes people have the most questions about this issue. And what am I referring to? The 144,000 that are mentioned in the book of Revelation in chapter 7 and chapter 14. Who are these 144,000 individuals? What will they do and what can we learn from them? Well, that's exactly what we're going to talk about in this study. So if you have your Bibles, open them up with me to the book of Revelation in chapter 7. We're going to begin in this location, Revelation chapter 7, and we're going to see what does the Word of God say concerning these 144,000. And we want to do something that's, that's kind of unique. Instead of going to books and articles and other videos to see what other people have said about it, we do not want to bring those other thoughts into our discussion. We want to rely upon the Word of God, what the Scripture says about it, because all too often what we find is this. People hear things, they've been taught things, they believe these things, and they cause them to look at Scripture through a different lens. This is not right. This is not good. So one of the things I'm talking about is this. When we look at Revelation 7, Revelation 14, and the information the Word of God gives to us concerning these 144,000, we find that what we frequently hear is not at all what the Bible says. For example, and I mentioned this in our previous study, and that is it is very common to say that these 144,000, they are evangelists. Now, Jewish evangelists. And when we look at the Word of God, we find no scripture whatsoever that teaches, that tells the reader that these are evangelists. There's simply not a basis for that, nor is there a basis that they are going to be successful as evangelists and bringing the greatest spiritual revival that this world has ever known. They are not the ones that bring a, a spiritual awakening. In fact, I would argue that in the tribulational period, there is no spiritual revival among the nations. Here again, let's see what the Word of God says. And first, we're going to look at this seventh chapter and see exactly what can be learned from this. Now, the first thing I want to do is actually set the, the parameters, set the stage for what we're going to be learning. And if you look in Revelation chapter 7, you see something. Now, we have learned that the wrath of the Lamb, we remember that God's Word tells us that all matters of judgment, divine judgment, has been given to the Son. The Son, Messiah, Yeshua. He is known as the Lamb, the Lamb of God that takes away all sin. This is why He died upon that cross. He laid down His life. So that no matter what sin I may have done or you may have done, we can find forgiveness. The cross is sufficient. It was a perfect sacrifice for sin, the sins of the world. But here's what we find. At the end of Revelation chapter 6, there is a clear message. 
people are fearful. When I say people, those who belong to the world. We are not called to be fearful. We're called to be faithful, to trust in the promises of God. We know that the scripture tells us that the wrath of God will not be upon followers of Messiah. So these that are mentioned here that are fearful, they are not part of the believing community. If we read carefully in Revelation chapter 6 and and beginning with, with verse 16, the second part, it speaks here that they are fearful. They're speaking to the rocks, for example, to hide us, to fall upon us, to conceal us. Why? It says here, from the face of the one that sits upon the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Because that great day of his wrath has come. It means it's, it's imminent. It is there, but it has not fallen. Now, how do we know that? Well, now let's go to chapter 7. In chapter 7, we find that there are several angels mentioned. And there are angels who are going to pour out this wrath upon the earth. And notice that there is another angel, and I would call you to read chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. Clearly says there that this one angel instructs the others, don't harm the earth harm with the wrath of God until something happens. What is that? Well, look with me to verse 3. Here again, the second part. It says, Do not harm the earth, nor the sea, nor the trees, until, here's the part, until we seal the servants of our God upon their foreheads. And I heard the number of the ones who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. Now, this makes it very clear. What do we have? We have the word of God saying that the 144,000 that are mentioned in chapter 7, they are from all the tribes of Israel. Now we see all the tribes mentioned there except for the tribe of Dan. Instead of Dan, we have Manasseh. There's great significance of that, but this is not the purpose of this video. I want to focus in on the 144,000 in a completer way, in a general way that deals completely with their purpose. So we can talk again about that in fact. If you really want to know, you can go to our teaching from the book of Revelation in chapter 7 and read or watch what, what I taught on that subject. But it's not paramount for our study. So what can we say? We can say here that these 144,000, they are 12,000 each from the 12 tribes. So 12 times 12,000, you get 144,000. And they are sealed before the wrath of God falls. This is what we can say concerning this 144,000 from the book of Revelation chapter 7. And at this time, I don't see how anyone can argue with that. That these 144,000, they would be Jewish and they would be from all the tribes they represent all the tribes of Israel. This is all that we know. They are sealed with a seal upon their foreheads. Now, there is absolutely nothing more than we can say about this group from chapter 7. What is dangerous is when people want to infer things. Now, I've told you that it's very, very common among most evangelicals. To, to yell out, these 144,000 are Jewish evangelists. I agree that they're Jewish, according to Revelation chapter 7. 
but I don't see anywhere here in chapter 7 that they are evangelists. And people will say, well, if you look at the book of Joel, there it tells us that. No, in the book of Joel, it tells us that in the last days before God's wrath comes, that God's going to pour out his spirit upon both young men and young women. There's an issue. Women are mentioned on men servants and female servants. And they are going to have dreams and visions and they're going to prophesy. None of this has to do with evangelism. And the fact that women are mentioned, we're going to see something that if you include what is said, and we're coming to this in Revelation 14 about the 144,000, you'll find these same individuals who say they're evangelists. They also say that they are men, virgin men. We'll talk more about the implications of that later on. And they want to say, because after we have the sealing of the, the 144,000 in the book of Revelation, what do we see? Well, I would argue we see a picture of the rapture. Now, others would say, and I want to be fair, my purpose is not to get you to agree with me. Really, my purpose is to lay out things so that you study for yourself and arrive at the conclusions, hopefully being led by the Holy Spirit, being, being guided with the Word of God, so that you can study yourself to show yourself approved. We want to encourage personal study. You pouring through the Word of God to arrive at truth, not believing what this person says or what I say or someone else. That's not the objective. It is to encourage you to study in the word of God. So what do we know? In Revelation 7, verses 9 and 10, we have something. We have a vision of a great multitude, the word of God says, and here again, I would encourage you to read it carefully, that there is a large number, in fact, it can't be counted. That's how large it is. From every tribe, every language, every nation, and every people. Very interesting. So we have now a group of people, and notice that they are before the throne of God. If you read more in Revelation 7, they are praising God, glorifying God, worshiping God. They're standing in his presence and thanking him for salvation. They have on white garments. They have a palm branch. That would be a, a symbol of the lulav. The lulav is something that is traditionally held for the Feast of Tabernacles. It speaks about the grace of God and depending upon that grace of God. So the image here is easy to discern. These people have palm branches because the reason why they're in heaven is because, it's because they have depended, trusted in God's grace. Now, when we look more at this, this passage, we see something. We see that they have come into the heavens, and here's what some would want you to believe. They will say because the ceiling of the 40, 144,000 is immediately before this. This means that these 144,000 were the ones who evangelized this group and caused them to be in heaven. They would say that they are saints that came out of the tribulation. Now, the problem is this. First of all, we don't see in Revelation 7, any indication that this group that is sealed are, in fact, evangelists. Secondly, if we move now to, to chapter 14, and look with me, if you would, to verse 6. Chapter 14 and verse 6. Notice what it says here. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of the heaven, having the everlasting gospel to proclaim to the ones dwelling upon the earth, 
to every nation. This can be every ethnic group and every tribe and every language and people. Saying in a loud voice, fear God and give to him glory for the hour of his judgment has come. Worship, worship the one who made the heavens and the earth and the seas and the living, what we could say, and the the fountains of water. Now, here's what we find. When we look at Revelation 14, here again, there is no scripture, and we're going to pay closer attention to Revelation 14 in a moment. But when you look at what is said in verses 6 and 7, especially in verse 6, it's this unique angel flying in the midst of the heaven that actually proclaims the gospel. Now, why is that important? Because when you look here, it says they do so to every ethnic group or nation, every tribe, every tongue, and every people. When you go back to chapter 7, and you look at this group that's mentioned in, in this heavenly vision that John saw, it says here, if you look at verse 9, from every, same word, ethnic group or nation, every tribe, every people, and every language. So we have the same four words identically. The same four words that appear in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 6, for who the angel spoke to, these are also the ones who are mentioned, who are mentioned where? Mentioned in Revelation chapter 7 and verse 9. Now, there's another thing we need to realize, and that is if you go to Matthew 24. Now, here again, the word of God is most specific. We need to pay attention to what the scripture reveals to us. Now, we'll go through this same example when we do our next video on the last days, but I want to lay the foundation for that by sharing this biblical truth now. Look, if you would, to Matthew 24 and verse 14. There's something similar. Verse 14 says, And this gospel of the kingdom was proclaimed to all the earth as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. I'd underline that. The gospel has to be proclaimed to all the nations of the earth, and after that, then the end will come. What end are we referring to? See, we need to realize that when words repeat, there's a significance. And we see many times in Matthew 24, this word end appearing, appearing in the first third of this chapter. So what end is it? Well, it is the end of the church age. Now, why do I say that? Because immediately after verse 14, with this gospel being proclaimed, and then in verse 15, the abomination of desolation, there is a significant change in the grammar of, of Matthew 24. Instead of saying you, referring to disciples, and obviously the disciples, the believers who will be alive at that time, there's a switch to Anshe Yuda. That means the people of Judah. And there's an emphasis upon Israel. Now, why is that important? Because the end of the church age takes place and then God turns his attention to Israel and bringing the remnant of Israel, those Jewish people in the last days who are alive, in the, the end times, bringing them to faith. Now, we'll talk more about that in a moment, but notice how the scripture goes together. So we have prior to the wrath of God. Prior to the wrath of God, the angel is going to go through and evangelize. We also see that before the wrath of God falls, 
two things happen in Revelation 7. The sealing of the 144,000 and this, this event where there is a great multitude, innumerable, that are in the heaven praising God. Now, here's what we need to realize. The book of Revelation is written using devices. There is a methodology that John, the writer of this book, uses. And this is undeniable. He brings, for the most part, Old Testament passages from the prophets primarily, but also from the Torah and other places throughout the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. He brings them in because they are known. And he adapts them. He puts them in a different setting. He makes a change to them. Why? Well, here's the reason. If you understand the verse from the Old Testament, what it means, then that brings that truth into a new setting so that you can understand that truth in a new way, a new application. And furthermore, we see that John does that same thing within the book of Revelation in and of itself. There are a few examples of this. One is what we're speaking about now. Now let's pause for a moment to, to learn something about John and his writing. You will find, if you study the book of Revelation carefully, there is an emphasis upon the number 12. Scholars will tell us that the number 12 relates in a general way to the people of God. Now, why would I say that? Because of the 12 tribes. The 12 tribes, God's covenantal people. And it wasn't by accident it wasn't a coincidence that Messiah, he took 12 disciples. 12 represents the people of God. And when you look in the book of Revelation, especially in Revelation chapter 21, what's going on there? In Revelation 21, we see a description of the new Jerusalem, that final state of the kingdom of God, not the millennial kingdom, but what comes after that thousand years, that millennial kingdom, the eternal kingdom of God called the new Jerusalem. And you find that the number 12 is, is appearing in the description of the new Jerusalem frequently. For example, we have uh, 12 gates. And upon these 12 gates are angels, 12 angels, who has the name of the 12 tribes of Israel. So 12 greats, 12 angels, 12 tribes of Israel. Not only that, but you have 12 foundations. And to those 12 foundations, the 12 names of the apostles. So here we see 12 being referred to us. And not only is there 12 gates and 12 foundations, 12 disciples, 12 angels, but also we notice something else. There are 24 elders. 24 elders, 2 times 12. We still see that number 12 there. And then when you look at the, the width, the length, and the height, you find the number 12 being reflected in 12,000 or 144 or 144,000. So you have the number 12 with certain multiples. 2 times 12, 12 times 12, 12,000 times 12. The number 12 appears all over. And this is what most scholars say that deal with this, recognize it. And that is the number 12 is a kingdom number, and the number 12 represents the people of the kingdom, God's family, God's covenantal people. Now, God is going to reveal who his people are in the last days. And I would suggest to you that that number 144,000 represents his people. Now, we need to realize something. When we look at what the Apostle Paul teaches, and this is foundational and understanding where I'm going. When we look at 
the Apostle Paul and his use of the term Israel. Remember what he says. He says in Romans chapter 9 and verse 6, he says, Not all of Israel is of Israel. Now, in one sense, that's illogical. Until you understand that Paul is using the term Israel in two different ways. They are related, but hear what he's saying. Not all of Israel is of Israel. What does he mean by that? Well, when he uses Israel the first time, he's speaking about the Jewish people. When he uses Israel the second time, he's talking about the kingdom people. And what he says is this, not all of the Jewish people are going to be kingdom people. We know that. The only way to become a kingdom person is through faith in the gospel. There's no other way. There's not one way for Jewish people and one way for, for Gentiles. One way for this person, one way for... No. One way. It's through the gospel. So what we find here, reading on later in the chapter 11 of the book of Romans, he says something. He says that when the fullness of the Gentiles come in, he is going to turn his attention to Israel. Now, when is that going to happen? We know. It's going to happen after the abomination of desolation. Israel becomes a great focus at this time. Why? At the abomination of desolation. If you don't know what that is, we'll study more of that in our next video. But just as way of an introduction, the abomination of desolation is when the Antichrist goes into the temple, specifically to the Holy of Holies, to the sanctuary. And he proclaims himself to be God and demands all people worship him. Now, prior to that time, idolatry was rampant. I'll prove that to you in a moment. But idolatry was rampant. But at that time, he's going to outlaw that. And everyone's going to have to pay allegiance to him and worship him. Israel will not. And Israel will go through a time of their worst persecution because their rejection of the Antichrist. And then secondly, we need to realize that two-thirds of the Jewish people are going to die at that time through this persecution. But there's going to be a remnant that makes it to the end. And what are they going to see? They are going to see the heavens open up, and now we're talking about the second coming, not the rapture, the second coming. Messiah is going to come and deliver, deliver Israel from all the nations of the world, that evil empire that the Antichrist will be ruling over. And Messiah is going to judge them and throw them into the winepress of God's wrath. We'll come more to that, that truth in a moment. So what we have in the book of Revelation, read this carefully, is that before God's wrath, there is going to be a sealing of the 12 tribes, 12,000 from each, 144,000. Then we see this great multitude in the heavens. And then what? God's wrath begins now here's what i'm talking about we see the number 12 referring to the kingdom and 144,000 they are kingdom people now listen carefully to what i'm saying when we look at the book of revelation chapter 7 there are 144,000 jewish individuals that are sealed they are sealed because they're going to go through those final plagues, the wrath of God. But God is going to distinguish them from the nations. This is all very similar to what we see in Egypt. See, the Hebrews, they were in Egypt, but in the land of Goshen. This is important because they did not have the same experience as Egypt the other Egyptians, and the other people who are dwelling in Egypt. Now, does that mean 
every one of the Hebrews who dwelt in Goshen that experienced God's shelter from these plagues. Did they all keep the Passover and, and come out? No. But there was a remnant who did, according to the rabbis, just 20%. The point is this. The sealing of the 40, 144,000, they are going to be sealed to see the faithfulness of God and hopefully bring them to that faith. Now, when we look at Revelation chapter 7, we're still there. We see something. In speaking about those 144,000, they are Israel. But what about this great multitude? Look again at the text, Revelation chapter 7. We see in verses 9 and 10 this great multitude from every tribe, every nation, every people, and every language standing before the throne with those palm branches praising, worshiping, giving thanksgiving to God. Who are them? Well, when you look at the scripture, we find something. Look, if you would, to verse 14, Revelation 7 and verse 14. The question was asked, who are they? And John says uh, to the angel who asked, you know. And the angel said to me, verse 14, these are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation. And they have washed their robes, and they have made them white in the blood of the Lamb. On account of this, they are before the throne of God, and they serve Him day and night in the sanctuary, in His sanctuary. And the one who sits upon the throne says that He will tabernacle over them. That is, He will protect them. And they shall not hunger anymore, nor thirst anymore, and will not fall upon them the sun, meaning the heat of the sun, nor any scorching heat, because the Lamb is, who is in the midst of the throne shepherds them. And it says here that he leads them to the living springs of water. And we find here that he is going to, that's God is going to wipe away every tear from their eyes. Now, let me ask you a question. When we look at what these ones who come out of the great tribulation, what they receive, is it unique? Are they going to be the only ones that are in heaven is these the only ones that Messiah is going to, to wipe away their tears, that they're going to have these wonderful promise of not hungering and thirst, and there's going to be no scorching heat? Are they only for them that he's going to shepherd and lead? No, this is for all believers. We can say in a general sense, for the church. But what is John doing? Here's the problem when people don't understand the nature of a book. John addresses his prophecy, this book and the visions, to those who are alive at that time. He's addressing them. So here he says, these are the ones that come out of great, the great tribulation. He's emphasizing those who are going to experience those things. But those who are with them represents all the church. Now, what we have in Revelation chapter 7, in the 144,000, we have God's covenant people from Israel, from the 12 tribes, Jewish people, who are going to be sealed to go through this difficult time. God is going to show his covenantal faithfulness upon them as he did to the Hebrews in Egypt. After that, not because of some ministry of this 144,000 mentioned in chapter 7, but after this, we have an image of the church. Emphasis upon those that came out of the great tribulation, but really we're speaking about the church from every tribe, every nation, every people, every language that are going to receive these wonderful benefits. This is a vision of the church of God before his throne 
praising him. So what can we conclude about Revelation chapter 7 for our purposes? Prior to the wrath of God falling, two things happen. The first is that the 144,000 Jewish people from the tribes, all the tribes, are going to be sealed. Secondly, in verses 9 and 10 and following, we have a view, a description of the rapture. There's an emphasis upon those who were alive at the last days that, that have that powerful testimony, but it includes all believers. So let's summarize. The 144,000 mentioned in chapter 7 are Jewish people, not the church, Jewish people that are sealed for the purpose of bringing them to the end when that gospel is proclaimed, when Messiah returns and their eyes will look upon the one who has been pierced and they're going to mourn. This is the 144,000. Here's what I'm sharing with you. This is what you want to write down and learn. The 144,000 speaks of a kingdom people from Israel that he is going to acknowledge, recognize, by putting a seal upon them. But because they're not yet believers, they are not part of the rapture. That group mentioned in verses 9 and 10 and following. No, they are going to go through this period of the wrath of God being poured out. Those mentioned in verses 9 and 10 and following are going to be taken away from, away from the, the wrath of God. Learn something else. We need to deal with the phrase, the great tribulation and great tribulation. Two very, very different terms. Great tribulation and the great tribulation. Now, learn something. The term, the great tribulation, are, are, is reserved for those who suffer persecution and tribulation for the name of Yeshua, for Jesus. They have faith and a testimony in the gospel and the right response to the gospel. And the reason why it's called the great tribulation with the definite articles, the word the, it specifies it. Why? Because of the tribulation they encountered were for Messiah. Now, when you look at Matthew 24 and verse 21, it says here that the people have great tribulation, not the great tribulation, but great tribulation. Who's that? Great tribulation is Israel. What they're going to go through, why they have been sealed for the great persecution they're going to go through. And we find here that, that many of the Jewish people are going to lose their life, two-thirds, according to prophecy. But there's going to be that remnant that is going to be preserved and make it to the return, the second coming of Messiah. Now, let's go. Let's go to chapter 14 in the book of Revelation, a very important chapter because it speaks much more concerning this 144,000. So before we look at it, in Revelation chapter 7, the 144,000 speaks of Israel the Jewish people in a collective way, not in a literal number of 144,000. Why? Remember, 12, 24, 144, 144,000 are all multiples of 12 for the kingdom. It speaks about a kingdom people. So in Revelation 7, we have a kingdom people represented from the Jewish people that are going to come to faith in the last days. Through what? Primarily because they see, they see Messiah's return with their eyes. They'll look upon, as I said a moment ago, the one who has been pierced. But now look at Revelation chapter 14 and verse one. It says, John is speaking, he has this other vision. I saw and behold, a lamb standing. Now, if you look here, this is in the Greek perfect. 
What's significant about that? It speaks about an event in the past, it's true now, and it's going to continue into the future. So this is speaking about the Lamb, who is Messiah, standing where? Upon the Mount of Zion, Mount Zion. Now, Mount Zion, Zion is, is a reference to the kingdom. This is a heavenly picture. Why do I say that? Well, if you keep reading, it says here, and with him are 144,000, having the name of his father, so his is the Messiah, Messiah's father, God the father, having been written upon their foreheads. Now, what's important here is this. It says that their name or their foreheads has his name having been written, meaning it's not something new. It's not something that just happened, but it's something that was true in the past, present, and extends. That same perfect is being used here. And I heard a voice from the heavens as a voice of many waters, as the voice of great thunder, as the voice, and the word voice can be sound, same word in, in Greek. He says, and the sound I heard were harpers playing their harps or harping upon their harps. And notice this, it says a song as a new song they sung before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. And no one else was able to learn the song. Now, what do we know here? This is a heavenly vision. Why? Well, Zion is mentioned, a kingdom word. But Zion, in this case, refers to the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because where are they? They are standing at, before the throne. Who's there? The four living creatures. These four living creatures, they're mentioned in the, the prophets and also elsewhere in the book of Revelation. Where do they reside? Heaven. And then we have the elders. These are the heavenly elders. So there's no debate. It is, it is a fact that these 144,000 are with Messiah, the Lamb. Where? In the heavens. So this teaches us something. We have a problem. We have the 144,000 in Revelation 7 being on earth. They're sealed. They're going to go through the wrath of God. But these 144,000, they are in the heaven. Now, remember, we are in chapter 14. In chapter 13, we have a review. If you look at chapter 13, it speaks about the first beast coming up from the water, water turbulent. Beast is an empire. So the first beast is an empire, an empire that's going to rise up, rule over all people, all nations, and is going to rise up at a time of, of instability. It's going to be the outcome of the birth pains. And what we see here concerning, concerning this first beast is that it's going to be very hostile to believers. We see that in Revelation chapter 13. Look, if you would, at verse 7 and 8. Undeniable. And then there's a second beast. This second beast comes out of the land. Land stability. This second beast, well, he had horns like a lamb, but he spoke as a dragon. Who's that? The Antichrist. And when things are stabilized in this evil empire, the leader who's going to take control is the Antichrist. And he is going to begin to persecute. He is going to cause people to, to, want, to want to follow him. He is going to do signs and wonders and cause people to take a mark, the mark of the beast, upon their forehead or on their forearm. This is what we see in chapter 13. But when we get in chapter 14, we are immediately taken where? To the heavens. And who are these 144,000 people who are now in the presence of God? And when did they get in the presence of God? The word of God is very specific. Look now, if you would, to 
verse 3 once more. It says here, And as a new song they sung before the throne, before the four living creatures, and before the elders, and no one was able to learn this song except the 144,000 who, notice this, who were redeemed from the earth. What does that mean? They're human beings. They are not some, some heavenly creature, creatures, but they were redeemed from the earth. Now, when we look at Revelation 7, and those 144,000, nothing is said about them being redeemed. This is why they have to go through the wrath of God. They are sealed because of the wrath of God falling. But this group is a different group. They are strongly identified with Messiah, with Yeshua. And they were redeemed from the earth. Look down to verse 4. For these were, were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Now, underscore this. Because what we hear so many times, in fact, there's a, a Bible teacher who I respect, I like, he's taught me much, but, you know, I'm wrong. Everyone can be wrong. And in this case, I believe he's wrong. Notice what the scripture says. That, that these were not defiled with women. They are virgins. Now, what he says is they are celibate. And that means, he says, you know, things are going to be so busy and chaotic at this time, and they're going to be so committed, they won't have time to get married and find a, a wife and such. Well, when you study the concept of virginity, it is not someone who, I haven't found the right one, I'm too busy, things are going on. No, virginity is always spoken of as a decision for a covenantal purpose, the purpose of marriage. Here's what I want to caution people. If we think celibacy is, is more holy than someone who gets married and is in a biblical covenantal marriage, this is not the case. Nowhere in the scripture do we see that. Do people have a call to celibacy? Some do. Paul speaks about that. But being with a woman does not defile you if it's your wife. And when it says here that these are virgins, realize something. If you go to the previous chapter, it tells us that that beast, that empire, is going to have you make an image and that you have to worship the image and the empire. Idolatry is rampant during this period of time under the administration of the Antichrist empire. But these individuals... This 144,000 did not commit idolatry. Many times what it says here, they were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Verse 4, it is speaking about them not succumbing to idolatry. They did not take the mark of the beast upon their arm or upon their forehead. They did not make that image to bow down to it. Now, notice something else. It says still in verse, verse 4, these are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. So here we're speaking about those who have a strong commitment of obedience to Messiah Yeshua. We don't see that in Revelation chapter 7. These are the ones who were redeemed from man. They are, notice this, the first fruits of God and of the Lamb. Now, the first fruits, this is important because this word first fruit is associated with Messiah. He's the first fruit. And it's associated with a day that he rose from the dead. And what day was that? Rashid, this special day called first fruits. So first fruits also has a, a, a connotation to victory. So when it says these are the first fruits of God and of the Lamb, they have victory from God by means of the Lamb. Likewise, it says, and in their mouth is not found, the Nestle Allen Greek text says, any falsehood or, or lies. The Texas Receptus has deceit. Not similar, lies or deceit, very similar. 
And these are the type of differences that you find in manuscripts. Two words very, very similar, but, but two different words, but, but very close in meaning. For they are, are unblemished before the throne of God. So here, once more, this group is before the throne of God. They are in heaven. And notice what we see in verse 6. We've already read this. In verse 6, we see something. We see that this proclamation of the gospel is not going to be done by the 144,000. Nowhere is that said that they're Jewish evangelists. No scripture. It is a figment of someone's mind that people heard it and repeat it and many believe it and many teach it, but it's not biblical. There are no 144,000 Jewish celibate evangelists. There are individuals, 144,000, I believe that is a symbolic number. There's 144,000, speaking of kingdom people, who are in the kingdom of heaven. And what do we know? Well, in verse 6 and 7, we get a passage that tells us something. John is speaking and he says, I looked another angel, or I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to evangelize, to proclaim to the ones dwelling on the earth, once more to every ethnic group, every tribe, every language, and every people, saying it in a great voice. What did they say? Fear God and give to him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come, Worship the one who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and the, the fountains of waters. So here is a proclamation to what? To receive the gospel. Now, this would happen when? We know when it's happening. This proclamation happens before the wrath of God falls. Now, Satan is very active through the Antichrist and this empire. But notice what it says, verse, verse 8. Verse 8, we have a foreshadowing. We are told here that another angel follows after and says, Fallen, fallen is Babylon, that great city, that from the wine of the wrath or the anger of her, this is this evil empire, her sexual immorality, that, that she made every nation drink. So God is coming to do what? To place his wrath upon those who committed what? Immorality. And this is idolatry. Now, of course, sexual immorality is part of idolatry. Read, for example, Numbers 25. What we find is that that sexual act oftentimes accompanies idolatry. But here it's speaking of it in a different way, speaking of idolatry itself as this immorality. Verse 8, and another angel followed saying, this is about Babylon, look at verse 9, and a third angel followed them saying in a loud voice, anyone who worships the beast, that's this empire, and this image, its image, and receives the mark upon their forehand or upon his hand. We find this one will drink from the wine of the anger of God, mixed, mixed up and undiluted in the cup of his wrath. And they will be tormented with fire and brimstone before his holy angels and before the Lamb. Now, what do we see here? We see this, this proclamation of the gospel, this instruction to worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that's within them. And then there's this proclamation, Babylon has fallen. Now, it has not fallen in reality. It's proclaiming that. What's going to bring about the fall of Babylon? God's wrath. So what we see here is this great number of 144,000 people who have a connection with the Lamb. 
Doesn't say anything here about them being connected with the 12 tribes of Israel. Doesn't say that they are Jewish evangelists. Doesn't say many things that you hear. No, the 144,000, they are the church. That's who they are in Revelation 14. In Revelation chapter 7, that number, 144,000, it's symbolic. It's the kingdom people, but the Jewish, those of Israel that's going to come to faith in the last days at the end. God has marked them. He, he is distinguishing them in order to bring them to salvation. Now, they have to receive it, and they will, the vast majority. But here's what I'm going to do. I want to stop for a moment and say something. The reason why it is ridiculous to say that there's going to be the greatest spiritual awakening ever in earth from these 144 Jewish evangelists, 144,000 Jewish evangelists, is that we don't see these tribulation time, those last seven years, as a time of the Gentiles coming to faith. Why do I say that? Don't say it lightly. But if you look, for example, let's look at two places in the scripture. Go back to Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9. Notice what it says, verse 20. Now, this is speaking about the trumpet judgments. First, we have the seals being broken. And the seventh seal concerns or contains everything else in the book of Revelation, including what we have here is these trumpet judgments. They are horrible, horrible judgments that are related to God's wrath. But the trumpet judgments usually have the number one-third, meaning it's not the full measure of God's wrath. But notice something. After all the death and suffering and pain that has happened through these trumpet judgments, notice what it says. Verse 20, Revelation 9, verse 20. And the rest of mankind, the rest of men, that did not die in these plagues. Here's what it says. They did not repent from the works of their hands in order that they should not worship demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see, which are not able to hear nor walk, and they did not repent from their murders, nor from their drugs. This is the word that we get in English, pharmacy. So it's drugs, speaking about drug abuse. Nor from their immorality, sexual immorality. Nor from their thievery, stealing. Now, if you look here, would you not agree that idolatry is mentioned here strongly? Realize in the last seven years, idolatry is going to be rampant in this world. This should form our understanding of what it means that these 144,000 were not defiled with women, that they were virgins. They did not succumb to idolatry. But notice it says here, they didn't repent. Where is the great spiritual arrival? Well, maybe it's later on. Well, it's not. Look now to the bowl judgments. Look, if you would, to chapter 16. Now, what I want you to see is that we need to know this book of Revelation, exactly what it says, the order of it, how it is written, meaning the literary devices that help us understand it properly. Look at verse 9. Verse 9 of Revelation chapter 16, it says, And they blaspheme the name of God the one having authority over these plagues. So those who suffered, and these are the bold judgments, God's full and devastating wrath. It says here, these individuals, what did they do? They blasphemed the name. That means the character of God. This one having authority over all these plagues, and they did not repent to give him glory. Now, very clear, they did not repent. Look at verse 11. It says, and they blasphemed the God of heaven from which they suffered these, these hurts and these pains, and they did not repent of their deeds. So I ask you, 
Where is this, this great spiritual awakening? Where do we find that? Now, here's what we see in the scripture. We see in the book of Revelation chapter 14, an image of the 144,000. It's the church. We see the church in the heavens. We see that before God, they are holy. They are virgin, meaning they were faithful. They had fidelity to God. They washed their, their garments in the blood of Messiah. That's who we're speaking about. In fact, what we would suggest is this, that that group mentioned in Revelation chapter 7, 9 and 10 and following is the same group in Revelation 14. Now, let me, because I know this is going much longer than I intended, but learn this. When we look at the rest of the, the 14th chapter of the book of Revelation, what we have is this. We have two harvests. Now, these two harvests are not saying one's immediately after the other. It's giving us a broad look in the same way of the parable of the tares and the wheat. Remember what it says? It says that in the last days, there's going to be this, this harvest, and he's going to separate the tares from the wheat. The wheat is going to be put into his barn, the kingdom of God, and the tares, that, those, those bad weeds, are going to be burnt up. The context is judgment and judgment time. Well, at the end of Revelation 14, it talks about that, that there's going to be a sharp sickle given and Messiah. This one who, and we can read it very carefully. Look, if you would, to Revelation 14. And let's look, for example, at uh, verse, verse 14. And I saw, I looked and behold, a white cloud. And the one who sat upon it was like the Son of Man having upon his head a golden crown, and in his hand he had a sharp sickle. And what we're going to find is that this one is Messiah, and he's coming to harvest, harvest believers. And then later on we find that the angel comes, and he's going to be the one, this unique angel, under the auspice of Messiah, of course. He's going to do what? He is going to harvest as well. He's going to have a sharp sickle. And he is going to harvest as well. And gathering, and I'm reading in verse 18, towards the end. He is going to gather up the clusters of the vine of the earth. And he is going to tread upon the grapes. And cast, the angel is going to cast them into this, uh, this, he's going to cast his sharp sickle into the earth and he's going to gather up the vine of the earth and he's going to cast them into the winepress of the wrath, the great winepress of God's, of God. And they are going to suffer his wrath to the extent that blood is going to come up to the level of a horse's bridle and it's going to go forth for 1,600 stadiums that's 1,600 stadiums, which is approximately close to 200 miles. Or we could say that it could come to approximately 300 or really three at 300 kilometers. That's how the blood's going to flow. And all of this is to tell us something. Exactly what Paul told us in Romans chapter 11. Because in Romans chapter 11, he says something. He says that God is going to work with the Gentiles until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. And then he's going to turn to Israel. And Israel's going to get saved. And when Israel gets saved, it's not going to bring about some great revival, as some teach it. It's going to bring about the establishment of the kingdom of God. Why? It says, if Israel, if Israel's failure means the salvation of the nations, not, not all the nations, not all the people, but a great number. If their rejection meant the salvation and their reconciliation of the nations, what will their acceptance be? Paul tells us this in verse 15. Life from the dead. What's life from the dead? 
It is a reference to the resurrection. When we hear resurrection, what should come into our mind? Kingdom. So here's what Paul's saying. God is going to move, and he is going to bring the fullness of the Gentiles in. That time of the Gentiles in with what? The rapture. After the rapture, God's wrath is going to begin. Israel is sealed against this wrath. Wrath. That doesn't mean that they're not going to suffer persecution, the worst time of suffering from the enemy, the Antichrist, they will. But, but while God's wrath is falling, we're going to see this is going to bring Israel to a state of dependence. And they're going to say, where is Messiah? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Where is he? And he's going to come. He's going to come to Armageddon. He is going to defeat these vast armies that are coming up to attack Jerusalem. And he is going to defeat them. The blood is going to flow for 300 kilometers, for 180, 200 miles at the height of a horse's bridle. Israel is going to look upon their deliverer, this redeemer. And then it says, and all of Israel will be saved. What does he mean, all of Israel? Well, he doesn't mean every Jewish person. He already told us this is not the case in Romans 9, verse 6, not all of Israel of Israel. When he says all of Israel will be saved, what he means is the fullness of the Gentiles and that remnant of Israel in the last days. And what we see here is this. Revelation chapter 7 speaks in a general sense of those Jewish people who are going to come to faith in Messiah and will be kingdom people. That's Revelation chapter 7, that 144,000. It relates symbolically to Israel coming to faith. And in Revelation 14, it speaks of those who are uniquely connected with the Lamb who are of the church. They are going to come to faith and be brought to heaven when? Before the pouring out of God's wrath. That's what we see when we study Revelation chapter 14. So, in conclusion, who are the 144,000? Nowhere do we see that they're evangelists. Who's the 144,000? God's kingdom people. Those from Israel, chapter 7, and those from the nations, which includes a remnant of Jewish people who came into faith before those last days. And what we find is the 144,000, that number is a kingdom number, the kingdom people who are going to spend eternity and what we see, those who are going to be shepherded and fed and nourished and protected and blessed, who are going to worship the Lamb and worship the one who sits upon the throne, worship God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for eternity in the kingdom of God. The 144,000, an important biblical truth, and it's this interpretation that removes so many of the, the, the difficulties and the contradictions that you find with other views. Well, I'll close with that. If you made it all the way for the last 68 minutes, I commend you for your diligence. Until our next lesson in the last days, Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.